you on a cool night like tonight. Uh, I know that we all have a great depth of interest in this topic and I'm really looking forward to a very lively discussion. Uh, we will have um, some, well I'll be asking our, our speakers tonight to present some information and their perspectives on the topic and then we will have a, a, a decent amount of time at the end for questions and discussion. So if you could please just take a note as we go through, you know, if, if, of things that you would like to ask and or, or to comment on and we'll, we'll do that at the end. Um, I'm from um, Griffith's uh, Autism Centre of Excellence and um, we, uh, we have a, a program uh, very much um, involved in autism studies, so we teach a graduate program in autism studies at uh, grad cert, masters and of course uh, HDR levels. And uh, we also have a, a, a very busy research program and some of the things that we're particularly interested in, in uh, at ACE and working on are of course um, school and really doing school better I suppose, making school work for uh, students with autism because it, it's just an area that is so neglected and uh, we have a particular interest in um, mental health uh, of students with autism at school and also um, participation and engagement and building capacity in schools, in mainstream schools, uh, well all schools really, for students with autism so that we get better outcomes. Um, one of the things that we do know is unfortunately that outcomes for young people with autism um, at the moment and historically are not all that good from school. In fact, um, you know, we have real concerns about the fact that uh, young people with autism are underachieving when we look at their considerable talents and abilities. And I think what we really want to focus on tonight is what we can do in the school system to make school a better fit for students with autism and really enable them to get you know, the, the school outcomes that are going to um, stand them in good stead when they move on to their post-school settings, and also to, to look particularly at that transition from uh, high school into post-school post life, so all aspects of that, so employment, tertiary education, and quality of life. So um, what we have tonight, um, Clip or Carrie has put together a, a program for you, which really, um, focuses on those those areas. So I'll just quickly um, introduce you to our panel. Um, if I can, uh, I can find the, oh, sorry, with the uh, little blurbs I've got here. I want to make sure I get it right. Um, so we have um, with us tonight, we have on my left, James from the ICANN Network. James is um, the network manager for ICANN, and ICANN is an organisation that is um, particularly focused on how um, you know, people with autism can thrive in the world. Um, and I know that ICANN has been very busy, James I'm sure will tell you a bit more about what the, their activities, but um, very busy advocating and providing mentorship for young people with autism, uh, particularly in the school sector. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, James's background is actually in entomology and, um, and from Griffith University, apparently, yes, um, and uh, scientific communication. So those, those skills have actually been, would have been very useful, I'm sure, in, in, your, um, in your work in the, uh, in the ICANN network. Absolutely. Jobs. Yeah. And we have Helen, Helen Whalen from um, Code Blue for Autism. Helen's also um, a, a, grad, well, a graduate of Griffith <laughs> Autism Studies Programme and I think still might complete some more studies with us and go on to the master's course. Um, Helen uh, has a diverse background, ranging from marketing through to um, uh, business development and healthcare. And she's also the mother of a 22-year-old son uh, with autism. Um, so Helen's going to uh, talk about uh, her work setting up the, the Code Blue for Autism um, and is also, has also um, designed and developed the uh, Chill and Chill Out programs, which mm -hmm. she's going to talk about tonight, which mm -hmm. are, you know, uh, again designed to just really facilitate that transition into adulthood for young people with autism. And uh, we also have with us Trevor, Trevor Beasley, who 
he's going to um, give us the benefit of his wide experience in the education sector. Trevor has been involved for um, many years. We won't say exactly how long Trevor's been involved. We don't look that old. <laughs> um, teaching and working uh, with students in um, with autism in the school system, right through from uh, prep to post school. So his um, his focus is uh, very much at the moment. Um, on working as a school transition officer, so very much in that space and providing support for students with autism and complex needs. So I look forward to hearing from you, Trevor. And last but not least, of course, we have Cheryl Mangan from the Living with the Autism CRC, um, which is a cooperative research centre uh, for autism, coming into its final phases now, the last stages. And Cheryl's um, very much involved in the research translation, so translating a lot of the work that's been um, supported by the CRC over the last few years now. Um, uh, we, um, we're really seeing uh, the results of that and Cheryl's focus is particularly translating that into a real life setting. So Cheryl has a huge amount of experience um, translating that research into um, policy, so high quality evidence based policy and also programs and technology solutions. So she's going to share that with us tonight. So, um, we, what I'm going to ask our speakers to do is to uh, just give us a, a brief overview of their interests. So, we'll, I maybe will ask them some questions as we go along. And um, as I said, our, our presentations will have two areas of focus. The first is to raise awareness of what we can do in the school system to just get better outcomes for students with autism, and the second will be to really focus on successful transition into post-school life. Um, and uh, so, as I said, you know, please, if you have any questions or comments, just hang on to them, and then we'll have time at the end to discuss um, the, the various presentations. So, James, would you like to start us off, please? And I was wondering if you could give us some background information, particularly on the issues around the way we perceive autism and disability generally, and particularly thinking about sort of deficit-based model versus the changes that we've seen recently towards a more social model of autism and also you know, the human rights focus. Absolutely. And I'm sure that's right up your, your street. <laughs> and um, if you could- Absolutely. Um, okay, just a nice, concise topic there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, primarily coming out of that strength-based um, um, attitude towards autism is that the whole premise of the I can network is replacing the phrase I can't with I can. So in our mentoring programs in schools, we try to reframe autism in a positive way and really embrace the interests that the young people have in those sessions. So the kids can work towards the point where they're giving an I can talk and it might be about a challenge they've overcome or a, or a master class in a particular topic they're fascinated in. We can have them on the construction of wooden pens on a lathe, to British colonial history, um, to ants, um, and all different sorts of things. But it, it's kind of, the first two or three sessions are where I see the biggest change because it goes from being a really taboo topic, is talking about autism, having autism, this thing that kids are really concealing from everybody. Um, and actually going into a place where most of, if not all, the people in that room are autistic and are talking about it quite openly. Um, and it's a little bit of a cheat, quite frankly. I think I, I can say the same thing that someone else has said 900 times, but it carries so much more weight. When I say autistic people who flunk out of high school and don't know what they're doing can then go on to university and do quite well, it's hard to argue with because I flunked out of high school and didn't know what I was doing for a long time and went to university and did quite well. So, yeah, it, it, it gives them a chance to talk about that as well and the things that they've struggled with. And um, I've, I've had a boy utter his first sentence in a program because he simply felt comfortable doing so. Um, he had some speaking difficulties, but um, what, what was holding him back wasn't his autism. It was something else, some kind of nervous tension. and. Yeah, he just, he just spoke more sense. His teacher went out of the room and texted his mum. I had no idea. Um, it was my very first session, actually. But uh, having that framework to talk about things led to this boy leading a very, very different life. He gave a talk at the Autism Hub about four months later. 
So huge, huge difference. And in terms of the human rights side of things, it comes back to that hidden disability um, kind of problem is you might see someone acting very nervously and, and, and wandering around, but they might be trying to enter a building they're not familiar with and that could completely disrupt their entire day. Um, a poorly worded street sign or direction um, or car park that's hard to find in a giant U. <coughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, it's trivial to me now, but I've been navigating cities for 31 years and, and, and learning to do that. 10 years ago, I would have had to go home. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to work in a place now where if that had happened, most people would have been quite understanding. But in other situations, no. I worked briefly for the, for, uh, the, the Queensland Government um, as, as a fire ant expert. Um, well, not expert, really. I sound like that to most people, but in the field, no. no. Um, but, you know, some of the attitudes toward autism I met and very senior people um, in the, the government were quite bad. When I told them I also work for ICANN, they said, oh, you must be looking to get out of that. Um, working with autistic kids, ugh. And then I said I was autistic, and that was a really fun, awkward moment. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, again, that kind of comment could have derailed me back when I was starting university. I was incredibly fortunate in that my lecturers um, were all a bunch of odd nut jobs who just saw me as another, another odd guy who needed a bit of help, and they adjusted assignments for me. But that didn't happen in high school. Um, in high school, my biggest problem for myself was that I couldn't see a path from where I was to a sort of functional adult, you know, leading a kind of life that was worth living. But neither could a lot of my teachers, um, and neither could my principal. Uh, so they kind of saw me as ending up in not a very good place in a few years, so why put the effort in? And I did have some really great teachers, I don't want to dismiss that, they were phenomenal, but they were working in a system that wasn't willing to be flexible around different learning styles, and they had to really battle. Um, and uh, having that attitude from the adults in your life who are kind of prepared for the world really kind of frames your own interest. I wanted to be a scientist, I had fantastic grades in science, I struggled in other areas. And I thought, well, you're one a deputy principal actually said, you'll never get to university like this. But another teacher scooped me up and took me away and told me not to listen to her. So, you know, I've got the two sides in that one story. But it was not a happy place. But my autism wasn't holding me back. The attitudes of the people around me were holding me back. So, Trevor, I think that's a, a really... Sorry, James. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Twins. <laughs> <laughs> James, yes, yes. And I, I, I just I just wanted to um, pick up on that point you made about the the fact that you know people people with autism vary so much. Absolutely. And that can be. I mean, you also mentioned the importance of flexibility at school. Um, do you think that you know that's something we really need to focus on, um, recognizing the individual characteristics of each individual person? and then being flexible enough to accommodate that. Yes, I think it, it, and it really sometimes comes down to teachers really thinking about what are you actually trying to examine. If your objective is to assess knowledge on a topic, does the method you get that knowledge really matter? If you're assessing essay writing, you probably need to write an essay, but oftentimes that's not what they're assessing. Um, you know, if, uh, if you give me a multiple choice questionnaire on almost anything, I'll do really, really well. Ask me to write an essay on ants, and I will struggle. So, um, yeah, we need, we need to set, take a step back and actually think about what we're trying to assess a lot of the time. And, and that simple step often leads to some real breakthroughs, but not, not for the students, for the teachers. So when we look at you know the requirement that schools make accommodations and adjustments, particularly in assessment, for example, I think it's a question of translating that into reality in schools. Absolutely. Like we've, got, we've got the policy, we've got the theory, but it's just how to make that reality. Is. A, te a teacher has come along to some of the programs I've been running in a school and she's been consulting with the hoses at that school about some changes that she can make. She wasn't even aware of what she could do for the, the kids in her class, but she didn't know who to ask. 
but in the last three months, um, she's enjoyed the changes in those students so much that she started coming along to our program to see what, what the kids are like in the program. Um, yeah, it, it, a lot of it's information for the teachers, but yeah, letting them know that they can do these things too. And just to, um, before we move on to Helen, um, <laughs> could, could you just um, just talk a little bit about the importance of, of autistic-led mentoring, you know, the, the work that you're currently involved with? Yeah, well, again, it comes back to what I said about the, the very strong argument that I can make that another person who isn't autistic can say the same thing and, and not have the same weight. Um, it gives them a positive role model. It gives them someone with experience they can talk to, probably have just as much benefit for the kids in those four or five minutes before and after class where we just chat um, about different things and, and struggles that I've had and struggles that they're having. Um, and wouldn't be able to do that if I wasn't autistic. And they can see me right there. I'm autistic, out and proud. Um, and they're Able to, able to chat to me and, 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 and relate. It just doesn't happen. You don't, they don't see role models for themselves. Right. Um, you know, I had, I had the, the Picard and whatnot when I was growing up from Star Trek, but I didn't have autistic role model data <laughs> and Spock, actually. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the role models aren't there. But, but with, through the mentoring, actually meeting autistic adults, they have role models. Yeah, yeah which is great. I'd also have to say that I do identify with your comment about the weight of what one says. I worked in the autism field for decades, and, but it wasn't until I got to be a professor. And I'd say the same thing that I've been saying for decades, and people yep. say, oh, wow, that's so profound. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Try working in an obscure field, OK? You know, I am nothing in entomology, OK? But God, people treat me like I'm God. It's, yeah. <laughs> Very true. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Helen. Sorry, James. <laughs> I, was just, I was just testing. Oh, I see. Oh, very good. Helen, could you um, talk a bit about the issues for parents and carers, the key issues, particularly around high school education and um, transition, sure. and also, you know, the, the partnerships that you have or parents can have or not have with yeah. schools? Okay, sure. Um, so I'll be talking around this as a parent myself. Um, so our son is 23 now and um, he was in a special ed setting um, for primary school and then moved to a mainstream school for high school with support. And um, the challenges were for, for us as parents around all of his challenges. So. Um, his difficulties with expressive and receptive language, his um, cognitive impairment, his um, ability to um, follow simple instructions, all those sorts of things, all of his um, presentation of who he is um, was a challenge. And then the, the dual part of that challenge then was for us as parents to convey all of that to the school, all of the staff, and for them to um, understand and then have the ability to help us um, work through all of that in that particular setting. Mm -hmm. And what what did you find were the most the sort of key things that made a difference um, from your point of view? I think um, Michael and I became serial pests at the school <laughs> from day one. We were there all the time. We develop relationships with just about everyone from the uniform shop coordinator to the principal, to the principal's PA, to the pastoral carer, to the subject coordinators, everybody. Um, we hold group meetings all the time, bring the same and some juice and keep them all happy, um, give lots of success reporting so they all felt motivated and, and part of the the journey or the success as well as the, the, um, the challenges and um, is really about um, taking them on our journey but in their setting yeah. and trying to make that happen with how their system ran and sort of squeeze in there. I think that really highlights the, 
uniforms are the whole school approach to them. I've heard of you. Yes. You, you mentioned the uniform shop yeah. lady. And yeah. I mean, the person in the office is probably one of the most important Key. people to Absolutely. be there. Yeah. Yeah. But it does depend on good leadership, doesn't it? From the school yes. principal down. Yes, mm. absolutely. Mm. And how important, Helen, did you, do you think a good support network is? Um, crucial. Certainly, um, so our son Colin was diagnosed on his second birthday with, uh, we, we were told, severe autism that would not be um, able to be, um, well, I think the words were, it was calamitous news and treated or fixed. Um, and so um, the first thing we did, apart from reading up lots of things was to look around for support networks <coughs> to see what was about. Um, and that was a terrific thing to be able to share our, uh, the beginning of our journey with other families, um, moving through and sharing the black humour that comes with all of that. Um, moving through that, coming into school years, um, that kind of picture of the support families became more and more pale in the distance because you, I guess you're sort of more um, confident and adept to, to um, running your own show without as much support as we were. Um, but then as Connor through school, as we got towards the end of school, we realised that he needed to find his own support groups, his own tribes of people that he could connect to now as a young adult. Mm -hmm. And um, that has been, that's sort of the journey our, where our journey sort of got to now. Um, I think uh, there was a video yes. um, of the, the red jersey, which is a great example of, um, this is our son Connor finding his first tribe of people after finding, finding a support group. When my older brother Connor was two years old, he was diagnosed with autism. He's had challenges making friends, meeting people, being a public group, and it just, just about everything I found easy growing up. But it was during high school where Connor found his true passion. Connor became obsessed with rugby. Every chance he had, Connor would be outside with footy. We would always play with our neighbours after school and Connor would always make sure that whenever we played a game, it would be taken very seriously. He even started his own competition called the Brookfield Cup. Connor struggled for many years in high school with not being accepted, not having the right skills to play on the team, and, and he was bullied <laughs> just for being different. Um, look, it's a pearl to look at, but people didn't include me, people didn't pass the ball to me at lunchtime or at the games when I was in the middle of the world. And that sort of stuff. It was certainly hard for Connor, who was just dying to play rugby, but was struggling to find a team or a club that would accept him for who he really is. At last, in early 2013, he found that team. Connor began training with the UQ Rugby Club. Dad was taken to training twice a week and into games on Saturday. And we were all supporting him on this new venture. Five years ago, I, uh, I met Connor and Michael at uh, an Durant's desk just up here over the corner. And we sat down and we actually had a conversation about Connor, what Connor had been doing, um, where he'd been up to that point, and how the environments that he was actually in weren't really the right environments for, uh, for someone that, was, uh, that wasn't confident being in, uh, in those full contact environments to an agreement that, uh, that we would be able to provide an environment for Connor to feel safe, to feel wanted, to feel part of the family, uh, and that's, that's what we provided. The club has become such a central part of Connor's life, and Connor has become an important member of the UQ rugby community. Oh, very friendly, I was like, it's a really like a family or a club or wife. The UQ team have been extremely generous and helpful with Connor's development in the last five years. They've even designed Connor's very own jersey to make sure that players don't tackle Connor as hard. But that doesn't stop Connor from 
trying to get started on the field. Having fun on the team is like, as I've mentioned to the boys, like the guys just embrace him so much. He, he brings so much joy to us just watching him kick a conversion or watching him take a take a hit and run. Like he, he always wants to carry carry me more than more than anyone else in there, but like he really gets around it. it it's something else. Like it's it's if you want to ask me what it's like, it's like nothing else I've ever played before, yeah. Connor has become incredibly independent over the last few years. No longer needing to be driven anywhere, Connor rides his bike everywhere, catches public transport, and UQ has played a huge role in his independence. The club is basically Connor's second family, and his dedication to the game has never been stronger. A few years ago in Brisbane, a group called the Ginger Cloud Foundation started the Modified Rugby Program that supports kids with disabilities to play rugby. This year, Connor has been invited to be a mentor and leader for other kids with disabilities who want to play rugby. Connor now mentors a young boy named Lockie. Next year, you two are going to run their own modified rugby program, and they've asked Connor to be the team coach. My brother used to spend his time alone with no friends and nothing to do. And now, now he's the busiest member of the family. Now he has a second family. All it took was a club like you for you to focus not on his disability, but instead on Connor's ability. It's 
it's a um, yeah, it's not a deficit-based program at all, and it's a program where people start to make connections and friendships while they're learning these skills, um, which is most important because 99% of the people who come to Jill, uh, the first thing you ask them is, what do you want from this program? And I would say just about all of them say a friend. I want a friend who will be a genuine friend and will stay a good friend. Um, so that's what our social skills program um, focuses on. And those um, priorities in the, the um, curriculum are around conversations, trading information, finding common interests in um, other people, reciprocating in conversations, group conversations, um, and uh, things like handling rejection, saying no, um, uh, expressing empathy, um, and using compliments, and uh, our favourite one in week eight, dating, um, <laughs> and, um, and other, other um, areas, but they're the main ones. And um, that happens across a 10 week uh, term. Most people stay on then and move into our Chill Plus program and our other adjunct programs as well because they're just starting to warm up and get used to the, the, um, the idea of when well, your first term you do 70 role plays uh, in a term of social skills. Um, and so it's incorporating drama. So drama is a fantastic creative medium that allows people to feel, um, uh, get, develop self-insight, um, to grow in self-confidence, their self-esteem to improve. And when those things happen, as James uh, said before, when you start to get feel self-confident, when you, your self-esteem improves, you feel warm and respected in an environment, you can do anything, and that's where we see so much growth before we even start doing the role plays and practicing the skills. Okay, so we're going to look at the video. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. to get chill um, because I was looking for a group format to offer some sort of therapy for Pat. Patrick has needed help with communication skills and social skills um, and managing anxiety and we were finding that by going to individual sessions Pat was really feeling like he was singled out. Uh, and he was becoming aware that he was different to his classmates and different to his sister. So he was becoming reticent to go to therapy. I always want to look at the different things, um, and particularly as George got older, I found it really hard to find things that weren't aimed at intervention. Everything is aimed at intervention. You know, yes, that was lovely when he was three, but unfortunately, you know, we are way past that now, and it just made it like something that that could give him a little bit of a boost. We enrolled Brody in Chill as soon as we discovered Chill and what it could offer because it was a type of program I've been looking for for a while for Brody and there had been nothing kind of, you know, every so often I'd have a search and nothing was coming up for Brody's age group for that type of program the social skills so it just sounded absolutely spot on for what his needs were. Yeah. Well we were looking to improve Pat's social skills, so anything that would help develop those skills, um, but also to find a friendship group and to, to help to kind of establish some sort of friendship group. So we weren't too sure whether that was either of those things or what we were going to get, but in the end it turned out to be both of those things. Self-confidence and it's remembering social cues, social skills, so just even things like don't sit down and talk 
at me for 20 minutes about a particular Marvel movie or something or other like that. But be aware that, that in fact, oh, actually now it's my turn to ask you something. And I actually think he's really improved significantly with that since his time at Chill. It's just like, oh, actually you're not interested in that. Uh, how was your day? And, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, that is so cool. Yes, thank you, Jill. <laughs> I would use that in the word, I think he was feeling lonely, I do, um, and I just think he's really blossomed, it's a terrible word to use, but I would say he's really blossomed since we started going to chill. There's beautiful things that we see in Bernie and family, he just seems more confident to show that to other people, and he's definitely become more outgoing, I think, since starting to chill, so other people get to see that in him, so that's great. My favourite things to do at Chill is um, meeting new friends. Here I've got a mate, Paddy, at Chill. He's funny. <laughs> he talks about funny stuff in the growing story. Does yeah. Make up crazy? <laughs> yes. There really hasn't been many situations where it's been it's been okay to be out with autism and in a group that, of people who are all understanding of that. And this is a group that he fits into really well. Like it, like it basically uh, warmed up, warmed up more between back when I first came and now. Like I was watching everyone and seeing how, and seeing how everyone behaved and just, just was being a bit, bit picky of who, of who I should be friend back then. Well now, I'm pretty much a friend of almost everyone, but Jill is an awesome uh, place to go to. And I'm looking forward to, um, to going, to going every week. I was feeling quite lonely after finishing school since I lost all the interactions I had at school. I know that what I was doing because all the structure of school went away, so it made it impossible for me to figure out what to do on the days. And yeah, I was just feeling lonely and looking for some like minded groups of people. It has helped me become more confident in the social, in the social side of stuff, as well as more, more willing to do stuff. I'm saying yes to everything now. Yeah. I definitely is a place where you can make friendships. schools, your, your preps, and um, through to year, year six or year seven as it was back then, your high schools, your special schools, and then helping kids move into um, you know, post-schooling options. One of the biggest pleasures that, and gifts that I got from doing the ABT role is that longevity of contact with, with students, uh, to the point now that, that some of the people that I've worked with are, are in their 30s. Um, so and, no, I, well I guess we could ask that as a question. Um, some of these little, these little uh, sayings that we have with, with Education Queensland. So ABT was an advisory visiting teacher and it was for kids with an autistic spectrum disorder. The concept of diagnosis is an interesting one, um, as, as Jackie would know. Having been around for quite some time, we've seen the evolution of the diagnostic criteria. So we've, we've been around in the days of autism, coming through to high-functioning autism, to Asperger's syndrome, uh, and, and the progression on. We often have a discussion with some colleagues about where have we actually come in the last 30 odd years? How far have we come? Have we made a lot of ground? And I was very interested to, to listen to um, both Helen and James and, and their reflection on, on life, both personally and um, uh, in Helen's case with, with, uh, with her son. Um, we all know that the same criteria still applies thereabouts you know, in terms of you know, your social communication. 
uh, that was, that's been touched on here, and, and Helen's uh, organisation is doing a wonderful job addressing that. But as you would imagine, um, the social aspect of school can be an absolute nightmare for, for kids on the spectrum. And so the whole concept of, of knowing how to socialise is not an innate quality. And, and one of the issues that I find sometimes with the whole concept of inclusion is there's almost like this belief that you can, you can have some of these young people with a diagnosis of ASD, you can put them into a school, and they're just gonna pick up on what happens without actually having the right resources and the mentoring involved to actually help them to learn. Um, I, I was speaking with a, one of the students that I had worked with many years ago, and she's in her 30s now, and I said to her, I said, Ness, when you look back at your schooling time, what were the things that, that were most beneficial to you? And the first thing she said was, even though I hated it, she said it was their social skills. She said the social skills and the community access, she said what that did for me was that she helped me to be able to understand all the intricacies of being able to socialise with people. What were, the, what were the rules that I needed to learn? What did I, how did I need to act? How did I need to adjust myself to, um, uh, to fit in, so to speak? The other thing that came out quite importantly was the fact about community access. And one of the key things there was that it gave her the confidence to be more independent, uh, to be able to access shops. Now, when I say shops, is one of the things that the kids will often do is meet at the shops. So they'll either go to the movies, they'll go out and have something to eat. Um, they may get there by their parents, but in her case, she was able to catch public transport. It gave her the freedom to be able to do that. So it wasn't, I don't want to go because it's overwhelming. She could say, I don't want to go because I'm just not really interested in what they're doing. So it was developing the skills to give her greater freedom and independence. Um, this same young person, if you'd have known her from her younger years to now, it'd be quite, it's quite a, a fascinating um, development. And, and she has two kids now and, and happily married. And I said to her one day, I said, you know, do you ever tell people about your diagnosis? And um, she works for the transport department with writing policies, so it was sort of perfect. She said, she said, you know, I don't really tell people about it. She said, but if I ever need to play the autism card, I will. <laughs> and, and so she'll milk it. And I said, well, how do you get on with everyone there? She said, I get on with everyone really well except for one person. I said, oh, why is that? She said, this person's on the spectrum, and we just seem to clash. <laughs> uh, and, and she did make the remark, you probably should have done the social skills program. Um, but, uh, I guess the point being that people have touched on a number of things that are, are quite important. And one being, when we have these young folk in schools, teachers do quite often just throw their hands up and go, what do we do? You know, how do we interpret this? How do we address these issues? And unless they've got that person that can come in and provide that assistance, it gives them the confidence to do it, it gives them the support to do it, and then that feeds on to the young person. And also the issue that you raised before is from the top down. You've got to have that support of administration mm -hmm. all the way down, and it is a village. And unfortunately one of the things that happens is people have one of these young folk in their class and, and that child might have some challenges. But the rest of the school potentially will go, oh, that, that child belongs to, to that teacher over there, but in essence it's a whole thing. I have seen a transformation over the years, having been around for a while. There has been that change and that shift. Um, now, the other question you asked was about the difference between the uh, mainstream settings, um, special ed support, and then special schools. Um, what I've found over the years is that we don't have enough flexibility, potentially, with what we have or provide. The concept that our school setting is exactly right for everybody is, is incorrect. We need greater flexibility and greater flexibility of approach and making adjustments to suit individuals. The concept of special schools, uh, to be at a special school where I am, you've got to have a diagnosis of an intellectual disability, first and foremost, and that's your criteria in the door. What we've found though is that there's certain phases within a school life of a young folk where they do come across to our special school, and often it's at the very beginning. So they might try prep and the families go, this is just overwhelming and it's causing the young person great stress. So they'll opt to come across to the special school. Once you get to the special school, you're not there forever. You can move back if you wish. But sometimes that setting is quieter and gives the opportunity to develop some skills and then you can transition back if, if families decide. The other thing we find is towards the latter stages of uh, primary school. 
many of the primary schools are very nurturing, very caring, very, very supportive, and it helps the young person to do quite well. However, then we move to the high school setting, and that becomes quite overwhelming for the student and for the family. And we do find we have some students who transition across to us at that point in time. The other, the other point we have is towards the latter stages of high school, we get around about that year 10 mark, and families start to think about the future, and that's something we're going to touch on then later on, is, is what lies ahead? Is the high school setting able to provide the support we require so that we can move on? And over at Mackenzie, as well as other special schools, we have about 30 um, <coughs> programs that we run from year 10, 11 and 12. And the aim is to provide opportunities for the kids to experience different skills. And we do on-site and off-site programs. And uh, we, we try and establish what are their interest areas, where their skills are, and help them to move on when it comes time to finish school. Now that's no different to what we used to do in the high school settings. Someone said um, about being here, and I can remember being here once before with a young guy from one of the high schools, and he was transitioning across to this particular facility. And um, so we did our visits, so we made sure that he was well aware of what the um, facilities looked like, where the lecture rooms would be, and it was just the same as we would have done when this young chap was moving into prep. We were having to make sure that we covered all the different aspects and all the variabilities because what we wanted to do was take the anxiety and the stress out of it all. And that's something else that was touched on before, is, is being able to remove that from a person's life and then the doors do open. So have I raved on enough? No, oh, well, I, but I think you, you were just getting on to the transition planning and I yes. really wanted to sure. just hone in on that for sure. and the importance of, of transition planning. Yep. So obviously, special schools, it's a mm -hmm. very important part of what they do, but to what extent do we, are we seeing that? In so hospital? when we look at that, I was reflecting on what we do at the special school and saying, well, how does that compare with what we used to do? And at the special schools, we'll start our transition discussions with families at the end of year nine. That's a little bit too early for our mainstream sense. But what we, the reason we do that is to get people starting to think about the future. When we worked in the mainstream settings, we would do it in that, that year 10 year. And it's never too early to start talking about it and start to plan ahead. And what are we going to, so you can't, you can't always say, look, the student is going to go to TAFE, they're going to go to the university, they're going to be a carpenter. We don't know that. But what we do know is that we can start to form somewhat of a direction. And by doing that, we, we alleviate stress from the family and we help to alleviate stress from the student. So our transition programming starts, our discussions start in the year 10. And then as we get closer to that end of year, we start planning for where we're moving to. The other thing that was touched on before, which is so important, is that once the kids leave school, we take away that support mechanism for them. And, and we see that so often that when the kids get to that point, all of that support's gone, they don't know how to deal with that, and then we find that we have some real challenges for those young people. Um, so coming back to what your, your, the question there, there, Jackie, when we start in year 10, we start nice and early, we start as slow or as quickly as we need to, uh, so that by the end we are ready, the young person is ready to, to move on to the next phase in their life. And I think uh, uh, the, the picture I'm getting, and certainly from our experience, um, is that you know there's a need for to have places to transition to. So the sort of program that Helen set up, for example. Yeah, they're vital. Those programs. Yeah, because yeah. parents have certainly I've had parents have come to me. It's like leaving school, especially if it's a supportive environment, is like being pushed off a cliff mm. for the family mm. because there's just nothing. But I think that is improving. I think. giving families some greater flexibility to do that. But I guess it's one of those things that we must always remember. We can't just say, okay, well, we're finished now and we're heading to university. Yep. There's a story where a, a friend of mine who works at another university, and um, she needed a person to, to translate um, recorded um, interviews into some hard copies. So what she did was she put an advertisement out. She said, this would be great for someone on the spectrum. She got 20 odd applications. And the majority of those 20 applications were people that did have degrees in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but the difficulty was they may have had all their academic success, but the social aspect,
kept them back. Uh, the person that she employed is still there and has been there for, for almost three years and, and has branched out to other areas and a little bit like James has been good enough to, um, uh, to, to lend her experiences and, and share those with other people. Which segues beautifully into Cheryl's particular interest and powerful passion, <laughs> which is um, employable employability for people with autism. So Cheryl, I'm wondering if you could uh, talk to us a bit about the work that you've been doing through the CRC into you know, really setting up that translation into practice for work. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Absolutely. Um, so we know that 70% um, of school leavers, That's thank right. you, school leavers on the spectrum have no study or employment compared to just under 3% of non autistic school leavers. And of course, we also know that young people grow into adults and two-thirds of adults in the spectrum are unemployed or underemployed. So this is quite a significant challenge to face and it's complex. We also know that when young people are facing that transition from high school to life beyond, like all young people, they're facing challenges and questions that they haven't had to face before. Questions like where they live, where they work, how they spend their time, who they spend their time with, how they get money, all of these things that are currently coming to the fore. And so it's quite complex. And so it's really, really important that we invite a group of stakeholders around that challenge and we face it together because, um, you know, we have a body of research at the Autism CRC which establishes that this is a challenge for people on the spectrum. We know that. We know that it's a challenge facing parents, we know that it's a challenge facing schools, we know that it's a, a challenge for professionals. What we want to do is actually create solutions with autistic young people to actually address these challenges, to make it something that's relevant and effective. So what we're doing at Autism CRC with the support of Telstra Foundation is actually looking at how we develop an online transition planning tool to support that process of identifying strengths and interests, of learning styles, of career interests and the kind of career paths that you're going to be most successful in as well as the appropriate work environments. And then scaffold a goal setting process to actually help a young person get through that process and actually um, identify what is the most, uh, the path that they are most likely to succeed in. Um, the challenge, of course, that we have at hand is we have a body of research and a research version of a tool of a goal setting process that works in a professional context and with parents and we still have young people. So we're going back to young people and we've been working with young people over the last 12 months um, to essentially design a process that's really fun and engaging, an online tool that actually steps them through that process, but it's something that they actually want to do. That, um, you know, again, these are really complex challenges. And if we want young people to engage in a transition planning process, we want to make it as fun as possible. We want to do that. So what we're doing there is actually registering interest for um, people to come and be part of our user testing session. Um, so as we develop a, this website that you can actually come and co-design it with us because we want the perspective of young people on the spectrum, we want the perspective of parents, we want professionals, we want teachers because ultimately we want to get this in the hands of as many young people as possible. extreme talent on our, um, the slide for our um, Autism Centre of Excellence, which is Tim Sharp, who's um, a, a, a young man with autism, an artist here in uh, Brisbane, and um, this is his character, Laser Beak Man, this was commissioned especially for um, the Autism Centre of Excellence, and Tim, this is Tim's vision of um, everybody, um, happy graduates, and um, Laser Beak Man, of course, in the centre there, and you know, everybody's excellent, everybody's different, 
and everybody can be a superhero, which I think really sums up um, what we've heard from our speakers today, tonight. So, um, good timing for questions, or uh, now we've got a hand up, shall we try Use the laser pointer. Up? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you there. <laughs> So, um, uh, Connor talked about rugby for quite a f probably from grade 10 to grade 12, um, but was extremely frustrated because they wouldn't let him play um, at school. And, um, and so, after school, when he still kept on about rugby, we gave up and started knocking on doors, going to different clubs. Um, my husband Michael um, went along to UQ uh, Rugby Club and introduced, well, he, they were sitting watching a game and met the um, uh, lead coach who then said, why not, let's, let's get Connor involved, how could we do this? And um, from that moment on, um, we probably spent two or three years cultivating relationships at the the club. Um, I had no interest in rugby whatsoever. <laughs> um, so he expressed an interest in rugby as such. Yes. But if you just look, we have a grand daughter. She doesn't not interested in sport at all. Mm. She spends the whole time reading uh, fantasy novels and uh -huh. you know, high pattern drawing. Mm. So I suppose the question of sitting down and observing her and say, oh, maybe she is really interested in that, and then start working. That's right, yeah. and um, I think that's the thing, is to be able to tap into your young person and work out, if it's possible, um, what it is that um, gives them enjoyment and what, what, what they, they love to do, and um, start trying things. Um, and, you know, eventually you'll, you'll find somewhere and have, have um, hopefully a really good experience like Connor did. He now works there. He's, he works one day a week, and um, yeah, loves it. Sorry, Roger. Right. No, no, sorry. Is somebody down the back? Hi, I'm Laura Lewis. Feels like six degrees of separation. Yeah. 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 Hi, Laura. Um, so bear with me. I need to share some background information to get to my question. So my son two years ago had one friend that was in grade ten. He's now um, counting down the days to graduate. He's so excited about his formal. He's got a girlfriend. He's got masses of friends. I watch him walk into the high school high-fiving people, and, and I still cry. Um, why? What's changed? Um, two things. He went on the ICANN network camp, which was April last year, um, and discovered autistic pride. So um, that was a really really important. He, he knew autistic pride from his family, but he did not know that from his school, and he did not know it from his community. After that, um, we were looking at, um, well, during that time, we were looking at employment opportunities for Clay. There were none, because no one was giving him the chance. We started a business for him when he was last year, at, um, 1st of January. So he's out, so he survived his first year of business, which is better than 50% of um, businesses. He's got three employees. He um, cleans Willoughby's, so it's not really exotic or glamorous, but he has an income and he has self-confidence. And he has a community who love him. They, they know he's autistic. They recognize him in the community we live at. Um, he is a different person. And that was just by us backing him, helping him um, create, a, like build a door rather than banging on doors because they weren't opening. And I have been probably for the last nine months approaching social enterprises, academics, schools, um, looking for grants, you name it, and saying this is this model does not have to work with just bin cleaning. It can be any kind of micro business that um, it will really any any kid could do, but particularly autistic kids because you can um, help them with the ways they they learn and like play. 
Why didn't go off when he first started his gym cleaning? He did just a little bit of the cleaning and I stood beside him and I did exactly what he was doing and showed him everything about it. I had my head in the bin and <laughs> <laughs> So my question to you, the hub, you know, of expertise is like, this works, this is helping him, it, it's helped his family. I'm now mentoring an autistic person in startup business. So I've got um, the, the, the on-floor effect in, in his family and, and his community who are being um, educated and informed on what autism is, because we use his, he's got 6,000 followers on his Facebook page, mm -hmm. and you, you better use that as a platform. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just asking you, how can we get this into high schools or into to the kids? How do we get this model? I, I'm, I'm not a business operator, but I, I'm savvy with um, social media. I've done a few courses and I know what works for content. And um, parents, give it a shot. You just have to be out of box thinker. So yeah, that's um, my question. How do you do it? How do we get it? How, how can we get it into schools or with more people doing it, more kids? I think the, the biggest challenge there is people not understanding how incremental it is. Because um, you, you, you mentioned the fact that he was just doing a couple of bins at the start and no one realises how important that is to the young people, um, how much that sense of responsibility. You know, it's not glamorous, but um, you know, I think we'll want bin cleaners around a lot more than we want caviar around. You know, it, it's really necessary and that's important too for the young people doing something necessary, feeling responsible for something, helping people. But yeah, I don't think people still get how important that first little step is yes. and that first little drip of success. Yeah, um, from someone speaking for the first time to someone running a small business like that. Um, and, and yeah, so the, it's, it's around the first go that I think the big challenge is and getting a school community to accept that. And that, you know, get, getting, getting them onto a, a team um, partially. It's, and then more later on. But that incremental nature, I don't think people quite get yet. Yeah, but that's the approach we learned and we were taught by rope, you know. Um, and Queen's going to divide the schoolies now. Tell me what year 12 student in the whole of Australia is going to the Formula One in Abu Dhabi and have it for themselves. He's paid for 12 months advertising in his school newsletter, but he can barely get recognition at the school because we have a difficult collaborative um, relationship. We're like you, um, Helen. We're the pestering parents. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's not been a, a, a very enjoyable path with high school. But thank you. Hi, um, I've spoken to uh, James before on email. Um, I just want to know when can you do another ICANN workshop? We met for a must account. We missed your first one and you said to me, sorry, we don't have one, look around, and I've looked everywhere. And I think it's very notable that you will, they make huge gains in something like that because it's detoxed from the rest of the world and bonding with like minds. So when are you offering that next one in Brisbane? We're hoping, hoping uh, early next year. Um, it, it, for us, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, I've, I've, I've really tried to get one through this year, but um, unfortunately it's, it's it's a good problem to have, and I can, we're just growing so quickly that we're having to really pick and choose what we're doing and find what we're, what we're going to... The, the camps are incredibly labour intensive. We love doing them, um, but when someone has to devote an enormous number of hours to a camp, we say, oh, can they be doing something else? And that's, that's what's slowing it down at the moment. So um, we're, we're running three camps probably next year, and one of them is in, is in Queensland. Um, so yeah, um, it will function at some stage up here, hopefully early in the year. I completely understand. I want to go on the camps all the time too. Um, <laughs> calling at work is a lot. So <laughs> it, you know, the, the, the camps themselves are amazing. And I will point out on the camps, we and the, the rest of the staff, we're just facilitators. The kids help each other. They, um, you know, they, they, they get dropped off and they're kicking and screaming. They don't want to be there. They hate camps. And the next, the next day they're, they're climbing towers together and encouraging each other. So, 
they are they are fantastic. And yeah. as, as soon as I'm able to, I'll, I'll have a camp. I, I <laughs> thank you for your interest. <laughs> also bad. Is that a regular question? <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Adele, my brother um, James is 29 this September and only was officially verified last year, so very, very late. Um, I think mum and dad always knew there was something. Dad's probably ASD, but an OCD, but never diagnosed that kind of good old chestnut. Yep. Um, and mum never wanted him to be labelled as a like self-fulfilling prophecy to limit his future. Um, so he went... Through, he, he did go, he was, he was removed from, um, it, it's a, it, it, he's high functioning it, and things like that. So he was removed from, he was moved to St. Joseph's Magic Junior, if you people don't mind me um, mentioning schools. Um, and then he, I wish to goodness he'd gone to St. Lawrence's up the hill here, but he actually went to Terrace and he had scoliosis as well. So now we've got this, what is, Learned he's got ASD at 28, 7, 8 years old. He's got an industrial design degree, mm. maybe because mum helped him with a few essays along the way. <laughs> <laughs> More than a few. Um, QT, please don't strip him of his degree. And <laughs> he wants to get into prop making, but he's got social anxiety issues. He's working with hearts and minds on some of that sort of stuff. But he has very limited number of friends. He plays Pokemon Go because, and he's working on his social skills with that. But I've got a background in teaching and accounting and music and a whole bunch of stuff. And and so, and I can see that I can see he needs a lot of help. He needs a male mentor because Dad didn't know how to mentor him because his own father was probably autistic as well. <laughs> uh, so it's it's a it's a cycle that I'm trying to support Mum and Dad in breaking. So they're going to something else this week, but. So what can we do for a 28, almost 29 year old guy who sits in his room playing computer games and watches, watching wrestling, going to Pokemon raids, to develop, and he works at Coles and Knightsville, but to, to develop his social skills, to develop his social confidence, because he lived with a neurotypical sister who's a child accountant and a few other things. So the nucleus family is very out of balance and there hasn't been a realistic Set of expectations set for him, for him, so that he can be proud of himself. What can we do to help my brother? <laughs> you after you can give me a lecture. I, I didn't do woodwork last week and I nearly killed like a thousand people. Like I I didn't have time and I need to do that to stay calm. So it, it, it's a huge thing. But yes, finding a tribe, absolutely. I am a fairly vocal guy. I would be called typically quite successful. I would not be where I am if I hadn't met the weird people I went to uni with and um, who liked the environment and also liked bugs. Um, and being able to slowly ingratiate myself into that group um, but it's a big effort, a lot of trial and error. Didn't work in high school, didn't work at TAFE, um, didn't work at online uni even though I managed to get through that but when I happened to walk into that little tribe of people it just worked um, and yeah it, it's trial and error. 
I was just going to say that um, the profile of your brother is very similar to many people who come to the CHILL programs. Um, it's um, a lot of people who come to us have social anxiety, have um, repeated year after year the lifestyle of gaming in their digital cave, not getting out, becoming extremely comfortable with that lifestyle. Um, because it's safe and predictable and all of those things um, come to chill are very reluctant um, find it uh, you know very different and somewhat overwhelming for some and then after time start to find a tribe within the chill community and see others within the chill com community starting to take steps out of there going to the places where they want to be, whether it's a Friday night gaming uh, club or rugby or ballet, whatever it is. And um, yeah, it's just extremely common for us. So we have, we do have, I mean, we, we, um, we quantify young adults as 18 to 24. We have 17 year olds come to the program. We trialled a teens program, but it was um, uh, very different to a young adults program because um, in the teens group we found there wasn't such a desire to get these skills and connect with others because they were already getting that forced on them at school and it was already there, so there wasn't such a need um, expressed by our teen group. So um, we have, and, and we have been inundated with enrolments for the young adult group, so that's what we focus on now. We do have people, um, I think our, we have a 29 year old, 27, 28 year old. It's not really around the numbers, it's around what your needs are, where your abilities are at, and um, where you want to go. Um, we're not we're not autism focused as such in the sense that you don't walk in the door and it's like, okay, so we've all got <laughs> ASD here. Uh, you're young adults, you come in, you want to get you navigate your way through the social world. We're going to give you a toolkit. You'll make the choices of when you use it or not, and uh, but we'll give you advice around that, and then. Um, you choose to, to um, take that on. I worked with a couple of chaps that have fit the description of your brother. One was quite severe. He wouldn't even leave his room to use the bathroom. And coming back with Michael was saying was that what we had to do with these two guys was, was that gradual introduction back into the world. And so we couldn't just join a group straight up. We just had to get out of the house. And one was to go to the library. Um, because there was something down there that, that motivated him. And so he would, he would come down for that. Um, uh, but it was just small steps and gradually, because we had to deal with the social anxiety part as well and that was another key issue. Um, I asked a student once, I was gonna do a talk and I said, what would you have me tell people? And he said, he said the first thing is to be patient. And he said, be patient, we'll get there in the end. Um, it would just take a bit longer. And I thought it was the best piece of advice that, that we could get. And I thought it's just fit with your scenario here. a lot of our peer mentors will work outside of our programs but they don't have capacity to do so um, and some are neurotypical and some are on the spectrum our mentors but are trained specifically in our programs um, so then it's not the support worker model but they don't they don't go and bring people you know to services
what we found the same thing with, with our model is that um, getting, getting young people on the spectrum who are able to be mentors in a program, in a school, um, as part, of a, as part of a model and a practice um, works really well, but getting them to be an individual mentor out in the community, again, it's much more difficult, much more labour intensive. Um, so um, there is some programs like that, I'm not aware of any in this part of the country yet, um, but um, yeah, the, there's, oh, I, forgot, I forgot the name of it, but yeah, it's, it's a very tricky area to step into. It's not as easy as it might seem on the outside, unfortunately that individual mentoring. Hello, good evening. My son will be turning 17 next month. He's diagnosed uh, um, malfunction with autism and uh, with ADD and with OCD. The only complication that uh, we are really struggling big time is because he's completely, totally nonverbal. So every time I attend this kind of um, talks, I, I envy, I definitely envy lots of parents that have the uh, verbal uh, kids because they can somehow have this kind of um, opportunities. But for the non-verbals, it seems like I don't know if it's so limited. I don't know if it's uh, not really that kind of more um, exposed in their kind of situation because it's really very complicated to deal with them. And so my question, is there any other programs? Because his only friend is my only also youngest son, because he's the only one that can already communicate with me yes. properly well. So for non-verbals, I uh, have this kind also of um, more sympathy, because they cannot really express themselves well, and um, unlike the verbal ones. So is there any programs that somehow we, the parents of the non-verbals, can have access and you know give these boys really the chance to also enjoy what the verbal kids are also enjoying. Thank you. Well, we um, I don't have any myself yet in Queensland, and I can we do work with um, with uh, non-verbal students um, and, and find ways of, of of communicating. A lot of it, a lot of it is just that non-verbal stuff between students. Um, one of our um, advocates, um, one of our what we call them spokes people is uh, actually non-verbal and he just wrote a book um, and uh, Tim Chant and it was just just released a couple of weeks ago um, so but you get the, the typical things we, we're talking about here yeah that I can see how they don't really line up with what, with what you're looking for um, it's, it's a very big challenge um, yeah, but I'm, also sorry. my best friend is my brother yeah I know but still only also maybe <laughs> more challenging for us is yes he's low function so he cannot read, he cannot write, yes. and the social uh, interaction is so limited. And But he is very, very fond of music. I'm a music teacher myself, and you should see how maybe not you can hear that he is he's singing, but once he, because it's always music that is always his companion. So if there's only one, at least one kind of group, or finding a tribe, that's what the gentleman said, Maybe I would have a hope. Maybe I would have this kind of, um, you know, security that my son will be all right in that kind of category. Thank you. Um, I could comment there and say that at Chill we, um, so in the two years that we've been um, running, the, um, sorry, at Code Blue, the Chill program, we've sort of moved from eight participants to 86. And we, um, our workshops are streamed according to people's abilities because, um, you know, we have, we have students or um, participants or what we call chillies who come, who are doing, um, you know, an honours year in biomedical science um, and stuff like that. And, and then we have um, chillies who uh, have very limited language. Uh, we have one chap at the moment who's probably got three words. Um, and so all of our groups are streamed according to their abilities to promote the best possible chance of these, all of them having connections and finding things in common. Um, we haven't had anybody non-verbal, but it's not to say that... Can you take my son there? <laughs> <laughs> We're not clinicians, 
Um, that's the only thing. We're not, um, we don't have backgrounds in speech pathology and those sorts of things. Our expertise is in drama and social skills. Having said that, um, we're launching Chill Beats next term, which is a taiko drumming program because um, we have so many participants in Chile's who, who want to do music. Um, and uh, similarly with some of the other programs in the visual arts and cooking and those sorts of things, but um, they're all social. It's all about the, the, the social connections in can those I, groups. Uh, can I at least give it a try? Will they be available for kind of services? <laughs> well, perhaps we can have a chat later and um, you know talk further because um, we have to make sure that we're able. <laughs> Son finished school yet? Yeah. Uh, I extended one year again in his school because apparently he's about to finish. But yeah. it's a good thing that the principal considered because uh, he's well contained, he's well managed. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't see any problem with him. Sure. It's just he's not verbal. So there's a number of outside agencies of um, post school providers that, that may be worth exploring here. The tertiary place, Suara, for example. I don't know where you live, but. Um, but thank you. Say Van Kills. Mm -hmm. Well, then, well, then you've you've got a few. Um, you've got Swara, which is just over at Dutton Park. Um, uh, West Side, it's just moved over to Yoronga. Um, it's another good facility. There's Help Enterprises at Sunny Van Kills. So there's a few places that you could explore, which would give you, which would give you the music side as well as the social aspect as well. Um, yeah. So that could be an op some options. Yes, please. Thank you. Just one more. Uh, just over here. Hi, just changing tack a bit. My name is Julia and this is Greg and our eldest of four is in year 11 this year. Um, he is going to be one of the blessed few who gets to change over and be the first one of the ATAR students next year going through. Now, we have modified his curriculum. He goes to private school where I've been one of those. I don't call myself a serial pest, I call myself a serial advocator. Um, they've been amazing. Um, we had a year we didn't think we'd make it through last year with a lot of mental health issues. Um, we couldn't find a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, this year it's been transformative. The school has worked collaboratively to reduce his load and look at an alternate path where he could still achieve uni, interestingly in Brisbane, to study criminology, but not necessarily come out with an ATAR score. That being said, English and maths are two core subjects that you need to get your high school certificate. And with the first year of AHA, they're going to have to be one of the pack and go in and attend a facility that they don't know en masse with other students, which would be quite comfortable for them from a sensory perspective. Unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be a lot of information available that I'm going to access. 
access from the school to the access around the same time like you can with that home, where you can actually have alternative arrangements where they can either be excluded or they can actually have different settings, smaller group settings to do for certain people that home, which is what we did. I'm a big believer to get used to the experience. We'll spin down some of those tasks. Are you aware with this massive change for entry into the tertiary system, is there any alternative paths for these type of students where they can sit, particularly the English and the maths? Because right now, we've got a great path for them to potentially get into a university, but if he doesn't manage those bulk exams well, that will be problematic for him. So, so your son has a diagnosis? Yep, he's diagnosed. Yep. So that in itself should allow flexibility in terms of where he does his exams. Fabulous. It's so hard to get any information. Everyone keeps saying, oh, we're not sure yet. It's still in five. It's a big change. We're just dealing with this year so far. No, so no, no you have scope to do that. You have scope to do that to provide an alternative facility. Yep. Um, because you can highlight the sensory issues first and foremost uh, as key factors. And if you were to put him in that environment, if sensory issues were um, then he would be severely disadvantaged and it could be a level playing field. So there's plenty of avenues for you to pursue to find another location within the school. It can be modules, etc. for him to do that. We've actually got an audience member who's chanting at the bit to answer that question. <laughs> Music that I use in the lesson, fidgets that I use in the lesson, 
know it's okay. And that's why I was big about telling people and my journey with the Future Leaders Program gave me that confidence. Because for so long I was told, no, you can't be that person. Thanks, Trudy. We're really, really out of time. So maybe what we can do, we've got some sheets at the front that have got everyone's contact details on there. So if you were a bit nervous about asking a question or if you still have questions, um, everyone has very generously made themselves and their organisations available to answer anything you have. Um, so maybe I'll just throw back to you, Jackie, for a wrap up. Thanks, Kerry. I'll we'll make this very brief because I know we've gone well, way over time, but I would really like to thank our speakers tonight. I think um, they've raised um, a lot of issues. We've had a lot of very useful information, and I think the message has been overall a very positive one. Um, I think we're making definite progress, and um, it's very important that we do share information about these positive achievements, and I think that's something that we really tonight, so if we could just thank um, um, James. James, <laughs> James, Helen, and Trevor and Cheryl. Thank you.